Right. Go ahead. So our speaker tonight is Nicole Kimmel. Nicole uh, has spent the last uh, number of years in the Aquatics uh, Invasive Species Program at the Alberta government. And prior to that, she did a lot of work with weeds. Yeah. Not that kind. I knew somebody was going to do that. Wait for that? Yeah. I got that a lot. <laughs> so she was a weed specialist for a number of years as well. Uh, but tonight we're going to talk about aquatic invasive species. And I'll turn it right over to Nicole and we'll get started. Perfect. Thank you. Yeah. So I have I have 23 years with the government of Alberta. So no small feat. And I've, contrary to other people, loved every second of it, actually. So I, I quite enjoy what I do. And it's a, a different day every day, so it's quite quite entertaining, especially in the aquatic invasive species world. So uh, I'm going to give you an overview of the program as an entire piece, and then I'm going to focus on an invasive fish side where we dive into Prussian carp and goldfish, because that's mo mostly what we're doing some response, active response on, but we have uh, responded to some other fish as well. So with a group this small, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions as we go along. I'm happy uh, to have a full discussion. Uh, there we go. So first of all, for context, uh, aquatic invasive species, the province basically uh, you, treats it as any non-native species, or it can be a native species that is expanding outside its known native range with potential to cause harm. And they have like a crazy reproductive advantage, which makes them challenging. And they usually have no natural predators. So they're really allowed to go and, and be um, dominate an area when they're introduced. So this is a picture out of uh, St. Albert, uh, one of their goldfish problems that they started tackling. Good? Yeah. Okay. Um, there's some environmental damages or impacts. So they displace the native species. They disrupt aquatic ecosystems, which are quite integral to uh, most of our natural ecosystems. They disrupt food chains, and then some of them even spread disease. And so this picture is out at Lake Isle, about an hour west of Edmonton. And this is one of the aquatic plants that we're dealing with. And this is uh, pretty much all flowering rush in, in the lake. We also deal with some economic impacts. Uh, so they threaten water infrastructure. I'm sure you've heard about invasive mussels. That's what's all attached to the prop there. Um, we are very much concerned about that coming into Alberta. That's where we spend most of our time is trying to avoid those introductions because we have estimated that an introduction on invasive mussels in Alberta might cost $75 million a year. And that's largely due to our irrigation industry, which is, you know, based on piping water for uh, crops and such. So um, that's a billion dollar industry in itself. Uh, most of these species, once they're introduced, require an extensive resource to manage and some of them aren't even possible for eradication. So we do focus on prevention as a priority and then we work to response as much as possible, but containment is difficult in the aquatic invasive species uh, side of things. Whereas terrestrial, you can at least, you know, start to contain and do a little bit more. What, working with water is much, much harder. And then the other picture I haven't covered here is the uh, spraying of flower and rush down at Buffalo Creek, just south of Innisfail. We have some social impacts. Um, so obviously the recreational use is coveted in the province and um, many of these species do threaten the use of our water bodies for many recreational uses, including fishing. Uh, some of them actually uh, threaten human health. So this uh, picture here is showing Lake Winnipeg with invasive mussels washed up on shore. You can no longer use this beach with bare feet um, because those shells are all broken and they will cut your feet. So uh, you can no longer enjoy this beach um, due to the shell accumulation. And then of course, reduce fishing opportunities. The loss of food source for communities is really the key factor. Disrupting the food, ch food chains does affect what fish are able to be there. So the, um, I'll just give you a snapshot of all the distribution of the aquatic invasive species in Alberta. So we have 52 prohibited species listed under the Fisheries Act. Um, that includes plants, fish, and invertebrates. And here is everything that we know about. So it does, um, we do have things located all the way up to Fort McMurray in the Peace River region. Basically anywhere where people go, 
invasive species are sure to follow. Um, you can trace some major detections. So all the green dots are Prussian carp, and then those uh, pink dots in the South Saskatchewan, that is all flowering rush. And we have shared both those species with Saskatchewan, unfortunately, because we weren't able to contain both of those species. So now they are have already entered into Saskatchewan. So I, I like to share things with Saskatchewan. Not for a lack of trying. Yes. Yeah, we started it. Yeah. So the, the fire and rush radiated out of uh, Calgary, and then it was there before the flood. And then the flood helped push everything uh, to Saskatchewan side. It? It's a plant. It's an aquatic plant that we brought here as an ornamental pond plant that people grossly mishandled, and it's thriving in Alberta. And then the Prussian carp, we suspect, um, was probably introduced as a goldfish and then released into the Red Deer River as ground zero. But now we have other locations throughout other watersheds as well. So, but I'll get to that in a bit. So no shortage of things. So here's just a snapshot of what um, I work on. So I work on invasive plants. This is probably the biggest threat of, of having to do response work in Alberta. So uh, most of my time is dedicated towards the plant side. So it makes sense that I came from a weed specialist because most of my time is spent on the plants, but I love the fish and the invertebrates as well. So uh, we're working on all these species. Eurasian water milfoil, we're only detecting on our watercrafts coming into the province. So we have no known detections in water bodies of Eurasian water milfoil, but it only takes a little section of this plant to start a new population here in Alberta. Yeah. So we haven't, we, we started monitoring in 2019. And so we've been kind of rotating around looking and all of them have come back as the native type. But yeah, it is a, just a matter of time probably because BC has it and we've had to close down our watercraft inspection stations on the, the Western side. So there's no protection from BC bringing it in. So I suspect this is probably one of the next species that we'll be facing, but so far, knock on wood if, if there's any. Uh, due to funding, we had a funding cut. So we got a little bit of surge of money because they detected invasive mussels in Montana. And with that close by threat, we got an injection. We got you know a couple more um, budget items. And then we were able to have a full station, east, west, and south. But we lost that funding after a couple of years of detection or monitoring. Montana's basically dropped off. They, they don't have muscles. So with that lowered threat, our funding also dropped off. And then our, our risk is highest from the east and the south. So we prioritize those with the cuts. So we had to lose the west ones. But it does open us up to invasive plants because BC has Eurasian water milfoil and they have curly leaf pondweed two pretty invasive species that we don't have yet, as far as we know. The uh, Himalayan balsam. Yeah. Uh, that's growing all over my neighborhood. I know. Yeah. So it was listed as in the Weed Act under two, in 2010, and it was in every town and city in the province when they listed it on the Weed Act. The towns and cities slowly started chipping away at their populations, and then the Fisheries Act listed it as duplicative effort in 2015, and we're still finding Himalayan balsam popping up here and there. Ten years ago, and, and it just it keeps grew it one year, cycling. And it's still still coming. Still coming. Yeah, the seeds are still germinating. That's yeah, stuff to get rid of. Yeah, and they they have exploding seed pods, which helps the dispersal yeah. of getting into the drainage systems, and that's where we're finding them. So people think. They're all innocent and they're just in their backyard, but they're exploding these seed pods, getting down into like the gutters, and then the water's taking them way downstream, and then they're popping up downstream. And they so don't it see seem, them. Seem to be viable ten years in the yeah. soil. Yeah, so. they are, but that that's pretty so short lived. The eleventh year, we'll see if any come. That's up that's a short lived seed. Some yeah. seeds are viable for more than a thousand years, so there's at least hope for the Himalayan balsam. But yeah, and then so flower and rush is by far our biggest threat. Uh, this picture is out of Lake Isle. Um, the entire shoreline of this lake is affected by flower and rush. And I worked on the first year of spraying. So it took me eight years to consult with communities and get permission to put herbicides in the entire lake shoreline to try and combat combat this plant. How do you contain it? It's on the Sturgeon River. 
Well, we're working on the on the front end, so it's draining into the Sturgeon River, headed to Lac Saint Anne, yeah. and we're prioritizing that area for hand digging and then spraying the rest. Is is how we're sort of tackling. Use the chemical, yeah. uh, no, we're using a special aquatic herbicide that's called the Mazapir or Habitat Aqua. Just got registered in 2012. Uh, so, no, 2021. Sorry, 2021. So just newly registered. <laughs> And then Phragmites is another one, um, this corner. Uh, Phragmites is a really tall reed grass, very prominent in Eastern Canada, and they have thousands of acres. So we're trying desperately to keep into our small little pockets that we're finding. The railway line is the main vector for spreading that plant. Um, so we're working with CN and CP to make sure they stay on top of their locations before they spread into wetlands. But um, so far we're working on very small uh, populations, but they are increasing. We're finding a few more every year. And then purple loosestrife, that's like the poster child for invasive uh, plants. People are quite familiar with that story, but we're still dealing with it. Despite our big efforts in the 90s with Ducks Unlimited, trying to eradicate it from Alberta, it still pops up from time to time. And then pale yellow iris is another um, pond plant, but it's a poisonous plant and it does pop up from time to time as well. So. Yeah, invasive plants keep me busy. These are the invasive fish that we've responded to. And so black bullhead and oriental weather loach. Um, we had one location of black bullhead up by Fort McMurray. In 2015, we detected it. We had legislation, the federal legislation came into place. The perfect alignment of legislation to make it able for us to respond to it came into place, but it was not cheap. So we were able to isolate that pond, had security 24 hours a day to make sure that nobody went in there and picked out a couple fish and then moved them somewhere else. So we contained the area and then did a rote gnome treatment and were able to successfully eradicate the one location of black bullhead. So we suspect that somebody, yes, that's correct. Yeah, so we suspect that somebody might've driven a pair, uh, breeding pair from Eastern Canada and introduced them into Fort McMurray. Is it a catfish or what is it? Yeah, it's in the catfish like type fish, yeah. And then the Oriental weather loach never hit Alberta waters, but it did, uh, somebody did bring it in through the pet trade industry and we stopped it at, at the distribution center. So we confiscated 40 um, north of Edmonton. There was a, a distribution center headed for pet aquariums across Western Canada. So we stopped them there. And so those are listed prohibited in Alberta. And then the other three fish are not listed. So they're of concern, but we are still responding to them. And that's Prussian carp, goldfish. And now we're also detecting rosy red minnows, which are our feeder fish that people seem to be taking and dumping out like goldfish. Um, so we have a couple locations like the White Mud Creek in Edmonton um, has a few detections of rosy red minnows as well. Where about um, so we detected them <clears throat> just south of 23rd Ave in the White Mud Creek, that, that pond. Yes. The, yeah. So, oh, okay. <laughs> and then I think there's a two other locations I can't remember off the top of my head that we found Rosie Red Meadow. So it's not isolated it's just to Edmonton. There's a few popping up. But I'll talk about more about Prussian carp and goldfish in a bit. So I'll maybe park that information for a bit. And then we have invasive invertebrates that we're dealing with. So we are very much concerned with spiny water flea. Manitoba is finding more and more locations. And most of our boats are coming through from the eastern Canada. And so we're very much concerned about spiny water flea. We are monitoring for spiny water flea. So we can reliably say um, we don't have it yet. Um, as well as the zebra and quagga mussels. So all our water, our water monitoring efforts cover spiny water flea and the zebra and quagga mussels, those two center pictures. Outside of that, we'd have one location of Chinese mystery snail. This is a substantial sized snail. If you saw it, you would um, take notice because it's pretty huge. It gets up to about four to six centimeters in size and uh, has a Opiculum, that trap door that closes. So anything we try and do, whether we freeze it, dry it out, use chemicals, it can seal itself for weeks at a time and avoid those um, conditions that we might be using to control it. 
And so that's down at Lake McGregor. We only have the one location. It radiates from the boat launch. So we suspect that it probably came attached to a boat. And when it was launched, it dropped off and then started the population there. And then next to that, we have the northern crayfish, which actually is a native crayfish. But we suspect that people are helping move this well beyond its distribution. Now we have, um, we sort of thought beaver watershed was its native range. And now we're finding it up in Grand Prairie, White Court, Athabasca, Cold Lake, anywhere down south. And just this last summer, Banff uh, detected it. And my closest known locations were Calgary city limits. So it made a pretty big jump out to Banff. So people are helping at some points on some of these species. The impact of the water flow. On, from the crayfish? On the water oh, what's the impacts? Yeah. So this is a pretty low trophic level food chain. And so it, it eliminates that bottom food chain and then trickles up is, is the, big, the big factor. And it's easily um, moved around because it can attach to things and then get dropped off. So we're talking like fishing lines, any gear that happens to be in the water, equipment, it moves around just as easily as the invasive mussels. Okay. Uh, they're not that big, enough enough to, that you would see it on a line, especially when they clump like this, but individually they're they're pretty small. Yeah, more than one then? Yes, this is, yeah, a whole clump. And so the eyes are the black dots. So this is a whole clump of, of spiny water fleas on the fishing line. And then we uh, die, dabble in invasive uh, diseases. So one noteworthy one is the whirling disease, which had a whole um, program swell up and then their funding was cut and now they've been absolved into the aquatic invasive species program. So we basically had about 40, I think 40 people working on whirling disease in its peak. And now we're down to three. And that's basically in the lab, which we don't have a lab right now because it got flooded and they're still looking for a replacement lab. So we're, we're operating out of a makeshift lab space. So, uh, and this one, we can't do anything in control of whirling disease other than making sure people are cleaning and drying and draining their equipment as much as possible, which aligned with our program anyway. So it made a, a pretty good fit for it just to come into um, our program as well. Is and- some kind of solution you can spray on your equipment? Or to decontaminate it from whirling disease. Yes, you can use chemicals to help minimize the risk, but it all depends on what your equipment is. So there are different types of chemicals that are suitable to your boats versus your neoprene, you know, hip waders or chest waders, that type of thing. So uh, they can, uh, bleach is pretty harsh though. So they're actually better chemicals than bleach itself. Yeah. We have it all broken out in our decontamination protocol. If you want to dive into some of the details, I can give you a link. Well, is there anywhere south of Edmond that does not have whirling disease? So Edmond, uh, there's four watersheds that have whirling disease. North Saskatchewan, Red Deer, Old Man, and the South Saskatchewan. Yeah, so everything, so everything except for the Milk River, not detected in the Milk River yet. Yeah. And I think, yeah, there, there's, yeah, it's basically we're holding as much based on containment with our practices of clean, drain, dry. There's nothing we can do to respond. And we are seeing effects in the Crows S Pass from whirling disease specifically on the populations. So they, they are being decimated. And it's in danger of whirling disease. Yes. And outside east and, and west and any other province. Yeah. So we're the first one in Alberta or in Canada. Um, so other jurisdictions are watching what we're doing, hoping that they don't get it as well. But yeah. So that's pretty much the overview. I'm going to touch on some other pieces that we do. So outreach and public education. I'm here tonight um, and we do as many type of events as possible. We're out to trade shows. We just did the boat show, the pet expo show. I'm out talking to kids. Um, we did a goldfish derby day in Lethbridge. That was that center picture. We have pop-up watercraft inspection stations. We had one out at Wabaman last summer. And then our, our canine dogs uh, support that program as well. And they come out as well. So we have three canine dogs uh, within the Aquatic Species Program. 
that are trained to stiff out invasive mussels as well as wild boar scat and an invasive plant down in Fish Creek Park. So we've got a couple of targets. One dog to do all three? We, we have three dogs. Yeah. And they, they all do all those species. Okay. So you can train one dog on multiple targets, but yeah, yeah you can keep adding. And all they work for is that paycheck that's hanging out of their mouth. That's all they work for. That's their paycheck is their special ball. So when they detect something, then their special ball comes out and they get to play with it for like two minutes. And there you love it. But yeah, they are, they are card carrying government of Alberta employees. Uh, we work on field surveys as much as possible, whether that's netting, you know, ice fishing, some reports come through that way. We walk rivers and creeks and streams. We electrofish. We get out there and we dig things when we find them along the shoreline. So we have a pretty robust program with just a few uh, of us actually supporting the response in the survey within the province. So there's just basically myself and a technician uh, for the summer that do most of this work on response within Alberta. And then we have a whole nother section that's working on the watercraft inspections. Um, there's about 25, 30 people there. <clears throat> and I've been talking about fire and rush. So when we started in 2018, the shorelines were pretty thick um, and, you know, boat access was getting difficult. And then this is a picture starting last year. We are chipping away some pretty big um, chunks away in the flower and rush, but there's still more work to do. So we did one year of a five-year project last year. And I'm hoping that the government doesn't change that much that I lose my funding because I did secure funding for five years. Um, but it could disappear with a new government, so we'll see. But I do have a five-year approval to use herbicides on the entire shoreline. And it seems to be working, and the community seems to be happy, so. Give that approval. How many levels of government do I think Well, just one? Just, yeah. Basic, well, the federal approval is delegated down to the province anyway, so we issue that, and then I get a separate approval to put herbicides in the water, and then a separate approval just in case I kill any fish to have coverage if I kill fish, but I've never killed fish, so yeah, there's, there's quite a bit of approvals, but I do have to engage uh, with the First Nations and the Métis settlements, so there's eight that have a, a claim uh, to Lake Isle, so it's, it's no small process. Yes, so we want peak growth. So we target middle of August is our ideal time because we want to have as much plant exposed above the water because that's where I can apply. Anything below water, I can't hit with the herbicide. So we're just hitting the stuff above water, but it, it does translocate down into the root system. And if we had an early frost, this plant could die back as early as, you know, end of August if there was a frost event. So we try and avoid that as possible. So about mid-August. And is the herbicide very specific to the plant or? It's not selective. So it does kill any plant that it is applied to, but flower and rush is the dominant vegetation. What we will try and avoid the cattails and bulrushes when they are present, but they're not winning. They're being overtaken by flower and rush. And then moving into our top threat is zebra and quagga mussels. So we spend a lot of time and effort in Alberta towards these species. Uh, most of our effort is on watercraft inspections. Uh, the one picture here on the right is uh, a commercial boat out of Lake Winnipeg. They bring them up in the winter and it was just encrusted on the bottom when I happened to be there visiting. And then the picture on the left is moss balls, uh, which were in the pet trade aquarium um, industry and somebody in in the U.S. found zebra mussels within these moss balls. No one was looking at the pet trade industry for a possible vector of zebra mussels and then we found them in the moss balls. So these moss balls are just like a basic aesthetic. They do have some filtration um, capacity in aquariums um, but so yeah by the time they were done the response effort in March of 2021, I think it was 34 states and seven provinces had confirmed zebra mussels in these moss balls. And we know what people do with their goldfish is the alarming thing that, so zebra mussels could establish and reproduce and grow quite well 
in uh, aquariums as well. So this is where zebra and quagga mussels are currently. So this map is fairly up to date. I've been waiting for an update. And so this one came out in February, February 6th of this year. And it shows uh, Manitoba is having more and more locations outside of Lake Winnipeg. They're now looking to Manitoba Lake and Cedar Lake and um, the Cinnaboyan River, I think, and Red River. So there's there's a lot more coming in Manitoba. Ontario is doing nothing about their mussels down in the Great Lakes. So we get a lot of things from Ontario as well. And Quebec is doing very little. Um, but yeah, some really close uh, locations. I don't know if I can get up and point. So the, some noteworthy ones are this one here in Quebec, really close to New Brunswick. And then this one is a new one in Colorado, they detected. And then this one in California where they um, switched the species that they were worried about. Um, so the green one is zebra, the yellow is quagga. Quagga is considered kind of the more adaptable evil of the two. Um, so if we had to choose, we'd prefer zebra, but they're both pretty devastating. So uh, you can see the two dots in Manit Montana. Those uh, did not establish. They were detected there at one point in time, but uh, never fully established due to whatever reason. And that has uh, happened in other states in Western US. But basically, Alberta, BC, Saskatchewan, and then the five, I guess it's six, six states in the north. Um, no, it's still five. Five states are working to keep invasive muscle free. And so we're working really hard as a joint effort. And it didn't take very long to get to the state. So they, they were introduced in the 90s into the St. Lawrence, and then they sort of radiated out um, through the water connections and boat movement from there. So we're worried about the snowbird traffic coming from you know, California, Nevada, coming back to Alberta, as well as the Eastern traffic. So this is our pr primary line of defense is we have these watercraft inspection stations. We have the three along the Eastern side and then the two along the South. Um, they pri primarily operate from April to October, if possible. The Dunmore and the Coots ones, we try and operate them at peak season almost 24 hours because there is traffic with boats that are high risk coming all hours of the night. And so we try and maintain shifts as much as possible to almost have 24 hour coverage. Cold Lake, Vermilion and Carway, we do just basically try and maintain an eight hour peak timeframe on those stations. It would be easier, but I think a lot of groups would be really irate. Yeah, I mean, it would be easier, but no one's been brave enough to do that. <laughs> so here's our numbers. Last year, we did over 8,000 inspections. 65% of them are considered high risk, and high risk is basically anything outside of BC or Alberta. So we even consider Saskatchewan high risk because they don't have muscles, but their program is pretty low capacity that there's a good chance that they might have muscles and not even know it. Um, giving you some ideas on night inspections, we found 19 muscle fowl boats last year and 14 of those were from Ontario. Um, and then the, the remainder were from Eastern Canada between uh, Manitoba, Quebec, and New Brunswick. So I'm, I'm meaning, yeah, anything East, but Saskatchewan hasn't confirmed any muscles, so they're muscle free. So it's been, we've received from Manitoba, Ontario, Quebec, and New Brunswick. New Brunswick, they must have stopped in somewhere along traveling, but they were based out of New Brunswick, even though New Brunswick doesn't have any protections. So Atlantic Canada has no invasive muscles, but Quebec, Ontario, and Manitoba do. Um, one of the alarming stats is we found 121 plant fragments attached to some of these watercraft. And like I said, Eurasian water milfoil, all we need is just a little section and we can start a population here. Um, we had over 1,300 people skipping. Uh, 110 of those were returned by an officer. We did um, 
try a pilot program where we paid the overtime of enforcement officers to be stationed at our watercraft inspection stations so that when people did blow by with a boat, they could go after them, um, you know, lights and sirens and pull them over and then escort them back and then write them a ticket for blowing by and then we do the inspection. So we're being a little bit more heavy handed on the enforcement side because we've been pushing this message of you have to stop since 2015 and we're still getting 16% blow by. So and enough playing nice. So the ticket for going by an open watercraft inspection station is $324. So it's not cheap, um, but yeah, some people might be willing to gamble. And if you blow by and you have your bilge plug in, it's a $324 fine plus $180 for the plug still being in. So you get two fines. And if you're mean, we'll give you both. <laughs> so pays to be nice to us. We had a major interception in 2022. This is our um, muscle fowl barge that came through. It came all the way from Ontario. It was headed towards BC and it was encrusted with the biggest invasive mussels we've seen in the province. So these mussels were almost three centimeters big. We've never seen anything that big come through our stations. So we did um, two actually, it's very similar, came across Canada. We only intercepted one and BC caught the other one. So um, they had gone all the way this way, this far, and could have launched without any inspection. So we cleaned the one, and I think it took us like 20 hours to clean the barge. It was so encrusted. So would you charge them for the yeah. cleaning fee? No, we don't charge. Not playing rough enough. Not playing rough enough. No, we want people to stop. So we don't charge them, unfortunately, but yeah. We shouldn't be able to get a permit to move that and let the clean. Exactly. If Ontario would play nice with this and not like allow these things to leave. Yeah. And these species, these species are prohibited federally. So Ontario and Quebec at the time of listing had some exemptions. Um, but now the yeah. That's got to go by a bit of Tons, yeah. Every, yeah, they have to stop probably every commercial vehicle way station that they go by. But yeah, so we work closely with our, com our commercial vehicle um, officers, but not every province has that same relationship. So we work with the sheriffs and the RCMP and even uh, the CP rail line police sometimes pull people over for us. So we have some pretty good support for from enforcement. Um, the province is so concerned about invasive mussels, we actually went ahead and registered potash, normally used as a fertilizer, as a molluscicide. So it will kill adult mussels without too many um, non-target effects. So we registered this in, in Canada and paid the bill to do it. And so all of Canada is benefiting, but we feel any response elsewhere would minimize our risk of getting them here as well. So um, Manitoba Hydro is going to be the first to use the registration um, probably this year. So what do you do? You pour it in the water? Or they got a yellow yeah, you make, a, you make a solution and you put it in the water and it stops the muscles from breathing and kills the adult muscles 100%. That's, they tried this um, approach in Lake Winnipeg when they first detected in Lake Winnipeg. They contain the south portion where they detect the muscles, did a treatment of potash, killed all the muscles 100%. It was effective, but then they found it on the north side, outside of containment. And as the ninth largest uh, lake in the world, they didn't have enough money to do a treatment for the entire lake. So they sort of had to live with it. Yeah, it's got a lot of issues. Yeah. But Mount uh, Manitoba is doing really good trying to make sure that people are decontaminating things before they're moving. So they're at least having these containment zones where if you're in there and you want to move out, you need to decontaminate. Ontario, it's like wide open. We don't care if you're here or there, you can go wherever. We're not watching you or monitoring. So Manitoba at least has some, some efforts. Okay. I need to hurry up and stop talking because I feel like I'm taking all your evening. So invasive fish response. 
going to concentrate on goldfish. So this is from people dumping their aquariums. People often think, oh, it's from people flushing their, their fish. That's not how they're getting into our water systems. This is people actually dumping them. I have over a hundred locations in Alberta and I can only chip away a few every year in response. And so last year I did five projects, the most I've ever done with the help of municipalities across the province. And we removed, we estimate about a hundred thousand goldfish from the landscape in just those five projects. So this really um, comes around to our don't let it loose, stop aquatic invasive species. We're heavily focused on the goldfish here. Do you post any signs or like any places selling goldfish? We are starting now to work with retailers so that you have some messaging when you buy a fish. You don't that, want your fish bring it back. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're we're starting with the retailers where you're buying all these things. Yeah. Give it to your cat. Put it out in your lawn. It's great fertilizer. Sorry. What was your question? I'm curious about John Hill. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. I think I have some pictures about Don's Dale in here oh, coming up. Oh. Wait, you'll wait. Okay. So here's goldfish. We've we've detected goldfish up to Fort McMurray, Grand Prairie, um, heavily associated with like towns and cities or stocked ponds. Um, so people seem to think, oh, well, the province is putting fish in this water body. It, it'll be okay if I put some goldfish. So it's quite notorious that we're finding our stocked ponds um, starting to pop up with goldfish as well. And so, yeah, they're pretty widespread. This is a worldwide problem. Other jurisdictions are also facing goldfish, but Alberta really is leading uh, response effort in Canada on goldfish. So those five projects, I think Saskatchewan did one project with goldfish. BC might have done one, but we did five. So um, we're kind of leading on the goldfish response. So with, when it comes to goldfish, we really rely on municipalities to step up because we have no control measure when these goldfish get out into our natural waterways. And as soon as other fish are present, we have no control measure. Where we're finding most of these are in stormwater management ponds, which aren't meant to have fish normally. And if they do have fish, we're usually okay losing the fish that they do have. And so we rely on the municipalities to do the treatment. So um, Fort McMurray, Edmonton through EPCOR did a treatment, uh, High River, Lethbridge, and Medicine Hat all did treatments last summer. And then this is a picture of us um, out at Lewis Estates confirming there's more work for EPCOR to do because we got some calls um, after a lift gate failed and all the residents were worried about them killing the fish. And uh, our, so our officer went out and did an inspection and found some, some evidence of goldfish, anecdotal. And then we went and did some netting and we pulled out goldfish. So we confirmed some more locations for EPCOR to deal with. So uh, the lid is just a, a selection of some fish that we removed out of one of the projects. I can't remember which one last summer. So these are all rodent owned fish. So they get kind of hazy eyes after the treatment. Here's Donsdale goldfish response. So yes, this was led by EPCOR. Do you have any specific questions on, on it? Well, I guess it was over two months. So yep. how long did it take that chemical to react or do its job? So they probably could have put up a fence of containment well in advance of the project oh. and then went in and did the treatment. It usually only takes about five days under normal conditions for the herbicide to dissipate through UV uh, degradation. So it doesn't take very long. Usually the stream part of that, uh, there's no water in it. Pond. Yes, so they do contain, so there are hidden outflows in any of these stormwater management ponds, oh, yeah. so they, they usually have to put a plug or a barrier or reduce the low level so it doesn't overflow. Yeah, they do mitigations prior to a treatment to ensure that the water is not moving. So they need to do a treatment where the water is contained, wait for the rotenone to dissipate, and actually they actually wait a couple weeks because yeah. rotenone only works on adult fish. So there could have been goldfish in egg stage in during the first application. And so they wait a couple of weeks and they actually do another application. So the, the really long time frame was probably them doing two applications within that time frame. No. no. We so we've been doing road known applications since 2015. Never had any issues. 
Donsdale? Where's Donsdale? I don't, I don't know the location specifically, but. Uh, Lassard Drive. Does that make sense to you? The word? Lassard. Okay. Okay. So we do encourage um, anybody that's doing a goldfish treatment, especially in these stormwater management ponds where lots of eyes are looking because people, you know, see the hazmat suits and it's, it's, it's kind of kind of alarming to some people. But and we could do this work of removing all the goldfish and all it would take is for somebody next year to dump fish and then we're back. We're back into access to the so we've we've done two rote node treatments in Grand Prairie because we did a treatment in our stocked water pond, confirmed that the goldfish were eliminated, and then two years later we detected goldfish again. So we did another rote node treatment and said, this is it. If you release goldfish again, you will lose your stocked beloved water body. So we're not going to stock it anymore. What is it? Bad goldfish. <sighs> Then they're going to move on to rosy red minnows. So I can't, I can't stay ahead of these folks is, is the problem. Gynogenesis? Yes. Yes. Yeah. So they can use the sperm of other cyprinid fish, which are mostly minnows, which are in every water body across the province. So there's no shortage there. And they can spawn usually three times, sometimes even four times a year and do tens of thousands of eggs at a time. Yeah, yeah. They overwinter, they, yeah. They can survive really crappy, low dissolved oxygen water bodies, yeah. They're like the frankenfish of fish. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, they're the same genus, just a different subspecies. And I, according to DNA, we think that they might actually merge back eventually, but they're not there yet. They're really close. We're like, we're looking at one letter to tell them apart in the DNA sequence that we're looking at. <clears throat> yeah. And then, so Prussian carp was first documented in Alberta in 2006. And Alberta is the first jurisdiction in North America and has since now spread to Saskatchewan. So the US is very concerned about our Prussian carp coming down to them. And so far we're holding the Milk River safe. So it's not coming down into their Missouri watershed, but it could be just a matter of time. Here's Asian carp, yeah, yeah, that's, I'm like, well, yeah, don't get mad at my Prussian carp if you can't deal with your Asian carp because they're the exact same, they're difficult to address, so. So here's the known populations of Prussian carp. It's still fairly, you know, not, and this isn't even actually the right map because the Red Deer River, must have grabbed an old map because the Red Deer River, you can like follow the lines of Red Deer River. So this isn't quite the right map. Yes. Just last year, we detected him within the North Saskatchewan in the city limits of Edmonton and Cardiff uh, Trout Pond, north of Edmonton. We've now detected them. So people are moving them. And then we had one location that um, in Sherwood Park. We're not too sure if that was Prussian carp or goldfish, but we're putting it as Prussian carp just in case. But it was likely a goldfish. So fairly widespread, but there is all of like Northern Alberta still to protect. So we are still actively trying to protect the Northern part. So Cardiff, would you uh, stop stocking it or how would you? We are in those discussions right now. Oh. We, we are considering not stocking it. We are considering a bait ban. We are considering a water body water, water closure. It's all on the table. We haven't decided on what we're doing yet. There is lots. Yeah. And it's weird that we only did, we were only kind of keyed onto it last, late last fall. And people were already pulling out hundreds when the officers were called there to have, investigate on a report of poacher call. So, yeah. But we sort of covered this with goldfish. There's, so there's prolific and rapid reproduction. There are capable of this gynogenesis. Uh, eggs activated by another species, but they're not actually contributing any DNA. They're basically just cloning themselves uh, through this reproduction activity. 
voracious appetite. They will eat anything they can fit in their mouth and they will live and thrive off of it. So whether it's bugs, small fish, plants, decaying plants, they can survive pretty much off anything. They, in their feeding activity, they like to like disturb the sediment and, you know, make the turbidity pretty awful. And so plants start disappearing as well because they can't grow through that um, turbidity. And they can carry a variety of pathogens. So we haven't even dived into the disease aspect as much as we probably should, but there are concerns there that um, some of the diseases could be spread or even amplified by this uh, fish species being present. They are slightly farther west. So they're in the Blind Man River up to like Bentley and I can't remember all the locations, but yeah, they're they're, they're west of Red Deer anyway. Do you have sure any weeks in? They do. Um, somebody just submitted a picture last year where they had cut open a pike and there was 40 Prussian carp about, you know, the five, five, six centimeter size. So they do, but when they're doing tens of thousands of eggs in response it's hard to stay on top of that um here's some key features so they are the silvery brown they are a short bodied fish broad um the really key feature is the strong serrations on that dorsal and anal ray just the first ray but that's also a key feature for goldfish so once you have those serrations, you either know it's a Prussian carp or a goldfish. Outside of that, you pretty much need DNA to tell them apart because goldfish start losing their orange coloration when they're released into the wild. And then they start looking like this coloration. Um, so if they still have hints of that orange coloration, you can say it's a goldfish, but as soon as they lose it all, then we pretty much have to rely on DNA to tell them apart. Oh, goldfish. Is that the Russian carp or the two the same species? Right now, they're considered two different species on the, under the same genus. But like I said, with the DNA, we're relying on one letter in the sequence that we're looking at to tell them apart. So they're really closely related. So yeah, here's the here's the comparison. So this is the goldfish. You know, normally they can come in the orange or, you know, variations of orange, silver, black colorations. But yeah, that bottom fish is a goldfish, but it could be easily distinguished, indistinguishable from the Prussian carp once it loses all that orange coloration. So we have to rely on DNA. What's the biggest one you um, I have a model of one that I think is probably 20 centimeters. I wish I had held out because I think we've caught some probably 25 centimeters in the 30 centimeter range they're they're big and their head sort of stays the same size but then their belly just gets distortedly gross and swollen and yeah they're really distorted when they really get growing so here's some management challenges we have for Prussian carp. It is unregulated, so we don't have it listed as an invasive species, but we don't have it as a game species or a aquaculture species or a bait fish either. So with that alignment, you can catch it, kill it as much as you want. Um, it's pretty much open season as long as you're following all other regulations. So you still need a license. You need to follow the bait bans for that water body. Um, if it's closed, you cannot be fishing for Prussian carp. So those things still override what you can do with Prussian carp, but we have no catch limits and no size limits. And that's what has driven some of the angling locations um, to be popular. We have confirmed, especially with Cardiff was basically the last uh, confirmation that people are moving these species around. For what reason, we don't really know, but it appears that people want to angle these and they might be enticed by the un, you know, no restriction limits. So they're moving them closer to home. Fish yes, they're bony. So it takes, you know, it's a, an acquired taste that people, but yeah. So nothing is more about Not yet, not right. that I've heard. No one's actively monitoring them. We're basically just taking haphazard citizen science reports and then Every once in a while, our fish files might catch one here and there, 
that they put into the system and that's how we're tracking things. So nobody's actively monitoring, but we will be working on an eDNA project uh, this summer that we start that will filter water and we will be looking for Prussian carp goldfish in that effort. So um, electro fishing is not effective. You'll never get them all. So we wouldn't electrofish. We could rote known, that would be our go-to, but uh, Cardiff is actually 11 meters deep. It's quite a big water body. So I did the quick math and it would be at least $100,000 just in rote known, and that's US prices, so. I'm gonna get there. Okay. <laughs> Response work, this is what we're doing. So we, we as a province committed to doing three years of netting effort at the Blood Indian Reservoir. So we were, work, we were using SANE, uh, fike nets and gill nets to try and catch Prussian carp. So we committed to three years. The first year we caught over 300,000 Prussian carp. The second year we were down to 30,000. And then last year was the third and final year and we only caught about 500. Um, so we think we might be able to net our way out of it, but um, Blood Indian Reservoir is a unique water body where we can actually deploy a SANE net and walk it out into the shore quite reliably without getting sucked in and we can corral the fish and then pull in you know thousands at a time um, when, when fishing's good but it is it is very time uh laborious and expensive to have our staff so the cold lake hatchery staff who stock this lake were actually doing this in their downtime in the summer um before the hatchery ramped up so Probably make damn good fertilizer. Uh, people have asked for me to give them authorization to use them as dog food. Um, we are reluctant to do that until we sort of really establish a good management plan. Right. Because we don't want it to drive desire that people will move them to other water bodies. So as soon as we create a benefit to having them, then people like to move them. So we're trying to balance it all and it's a lot to balance. So here's, yeah, some of the fike nets. We caught some pretty substantial fish. And then we've, last year we noticed some class sizes um, starting to disappear from the water body. So we think we might be netting our way out, but we are reviewing uh, those efforts to see if it's really economic worthy and if they could be, could be deployed elsewhere. So Blood Indian Reservoir was kind of suited to this netting effort. Not all lakes are suited to the netting efforts. And we haven't quite teased out how and when and like what, what brings them in. Do they like the warm part of the day, the cold part of the day? Do they like being deep or shallow? And when do they feed? And you know, there's all these behaviors that we don't know how they're operating in Alberta yet. Yeah, we're also concerned about that. Yeah, the, the, the response to the, the mass removal might be exponential reproduction so yes we'll have to monitor that and then here we get we've already touched on this cardiff trout pond was a new location um we had basically two report a poacher calls um to our officers and they went out they had never been out to cardiff trout pond and so the officers were quite interested on what was going on they gathered some fish from a fisherman because i told them that if they could see any samples to gather some because i needed some for dna to confirm that they weren't goldfish and yeah they did come back as prussian carp and so we at the time we thought that they were it was the only location in north saskatchewan but then we did confirm the the north saskatchewan uh, river in edmonton with a second fish so with the officer's report and confirmation of the fish gathering, then while the lab results were out, uh, the Cold Lake hatchery staff also went out to Cardiff Trout Pond, deployed fike and gill nets trying to catch Prussian carp. We actually only caught eight, but it was enough to confirm that they were there. Um, but the fishermen were doing a lot better effort. They were catching buckets full. So we might need to re rethink our netting efforts. And we also found northern crayfish. So our nets actually um, resulted in thousands. So this is one of those big Rubbermaid totes. So it's about this full of crayfish. And so we think there's thousands of crayfish that we, we didn't return these back to the water body, but northern crayfish are very much present in Cardiff trout pond as well. 
which might also help, you know, explain why the trout fish aren't doing that well when we're stocking them. So we uh, eliminated a good chunk of them. So we are exploring response options. Those uh, discussions are still ongoing. We have made no decisions, but um, hopefully soon because open water season is right around the corner. And um, we are also trying to assess to some extent our, our current strategies of encouraging the desire for Prussian carp angling occurring. And if so, do we need to step away from our catch and kill it uh, approach? Maybe we're, we're driving that um, desire to have them. So we're also, all these discussions are underway. So in closure, what can you do to support? Clean, drain, dry your gear, simple as that. Three simple actions can stop um, about 95% of these aquatic invasive species that I'm highlighting today. Don't let it loose. We are targeting the pet trade industry through the goldfish silhouette. Bait fish is also a problem. That's all the little fish. The big sport fish, people are still moving around sport fish as well. And then the water garden, releasing water plants aquatic plants. And then the crab is uh, the live food market. So we are worried about like your TNTs that are offering free, uh, fresh, or not free, fresh um, live food for food consumption are also a threat. What about the leeches that are fishing your cell? They're bringing in water that could have, imagine the... So we had a scare last year of shiners being brought in from Ontario and then we found an invasive mussel in the bait container mm -hmm. and so yes we're very concerned about it's alive and it's water yes and yes there there's disease place. species yes I would love to put a live bait fan in or fresh bait or any of that and move yeah. To, yeah well you know I would I try but people are above me care about what people think <laughs> So yeah, don't let it loose um, applies to many industries, but simple messaging. And so this logo, I don't know if you've really had a chance to really look at these logos, but people think that they're releasing goldfish. So that's the dumping, uh, the, the pail, but look at the water. There's silhouettes of all the species that might be hiding in the water. So there's fish, plants, crabs, invertebrates, all, all the species that you think that you don't have in there, you actually might be dumping. So it's a really well thought out. This is a national campaign. You will start to see these logos across Canada, um, thanks to GFO. So take action, report invasive species and sightings of any illegal activity. Don't let it loose, never move fish between water bodies. If invasive fish are caught, do not return it to the water, catch it, kill it, and either consume or dispose of properly. Um, you can report 24 hours, seven days a week to our AS hotline. And then we also have an online and phone app called EdMaps, where you can report any species through your phone as well. And those reports come to me for verification. So you'll basically be reporting them to me anyway. And so part partnerships is essential to tackling aquatic invasive species in Alberta. And thank you. There's my email, my phone numbers and any more questions you want to talk about decontamination or are you cleaning well decontamination of trailers i have a, a lady out about two years ago on the river she was working for fisheries in uh dry creek cleaning equipment but basically our trailers have got hollow metal frames which hold water mm -hmm. they have carpeting on the bunkers and there's really no way to get that water out in a reasonable time. Yeah. yeah. They can be in the garage for a week and it will fill up water when you move it. Yeah. And there's so much you can do. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you, you can add, so we, yeah, we can add temperature if you don't want to use chemicals. So that's our, our line of defense. If you can't dry and drain things, then you have to elevate to either, either using temperature, pressure, would clean things off as well. And you like basically replace that water with fresh, clean water. So and that on the exposure, so you can't do that in the middle frame. In, inside, yeah, yeah. And then chemical is the other third line of defense. So if you can institute any of those extra measures, then that would be best. But yeah, I, we do recognize that it's hard. And our, our fish bios are going in water bodies across multiple times in the day sometimes, so yeah. We face the same challenges. What's concentration of ozone? 
water, how much salt going for down the water or whatever. So the, the rate that what we're trying to reach is four parts per million. Yeah. So if you pour that in a lake and it's expelling out, you said five days before it's planned. Yeah. So we can use per potassium permanganate to deactivate it. So if water needs to be released, so Parks Canada, you'll probably hear from Shelly next week because I was involved in that project. They they use a deactivator downstream. All right away. So they do rote known and then they have a deactivator downstream to safeguard all the fish downstream. So they can compartmentalize it without having to contain the water, but they have to have two chemicals being introduced. So one kills the fish and then it gets deactivated downstream. Yeah, Miramichi, Miramichi and yeah, a couple other locations. Yeah, I don't know if I think they're having barriers or some there's some sort of barrier protection. But I think you'll hear more from Shelly. So she knows it better, but and they've they've been rotating. So I think they're on their third set of lakes or something with their rote known in Parks Canada, Alberta. So yeah. The talks in two weeks, we'll learn a little bit more. Yeah, Shelly. Shelly's amazing. So it's good. Any other questions? That was a great talk. It was good. We'll come up for your free swag. Thanks very much, Nicole. Yeah. I learned a lot tonight. I think, uh, I think the audience. Uh, there's two people online. Yeah. Peter, came on. Peter came on. I'll let you have your seat back if you want to take over. Peter, is that him playing a part? <laughs> Maybe online people have a seat. Oh, you can kill it or take a picture of anybody. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you don't know what it is, you better. Kill Put it, it back, but if you know what it is and you know it's in something invasive, kill it. Yeah.